Hey boys and girls, today is that part of the show where we talk about the crazy things that can happen in quantum physics. Or should I say, welcome to the jungle. Check this out. If you've got a hill, and you got a little dip in the hill, and then the hole gets way lower over here, and then the hill's finished with, and you put a pink bouncy ball, like you stole it from your sister, and you just set it down right there, that bouncy ball, as long as you never touch it, will never go over here, right? Because to do so, it would have to get through a higher energy level. What? No, that's not going to work. But in quantum, it will. In fact, balls regularly tunnel through places they shouldn't ever be able to go in order to get to a lower energy state. Of course, it would never want to go up here, so it's not even going to try it. I mean, assuming this goes this direction. But I'm saying that this ball knows that there's a nicer place that it can go over here. Or maybe the ball is sort of spreading out and testing whether it could go over here and get to a lower energy state and reduce the energy of the universe. And it finds that sometimes it can. Yay, so the ball can go down here because it just goes right through the hill. Remember, we didn't push it over the hill, it went right through it. Tunneling is weird. Also, if you take helium and you boil it, it's gotta be a special kind of helium. Here's my container, and I'm planning to put some helium in here. It's not really colored purple. Sorry, I just reached for the purple. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pump on it. So I'll put a bell jar on top of it or something and have a little hose coming out here and connect it to a pump. And that pump is going to be removing any air that happens to be around there and uh, additionally removing helium. So we're going to make the pressure extremely low in here and preferentially that'll cause the fastest of these helium molecules here to evaporate. This is liquid helium in here. Liquid helium. Liquid helium, it's special kind of helium. Go figure out what kind you need to get. But the cool thing is, when you get this cold enough, what you'll be doing is you're cooling it down. Liquid helium is cool at four Kelvin or so, and <clears throat> it will boil then. But if we reduce the pressure, it boils at an even lower temperature. And since we're removing the fastest ones, we're actually cooling down the liquid helium by pumping on it. So we pump on the liquid helium, and it becomes cooler and cooler. And when it reaches what's called a critical point at around 2 Kelvin, so if we reduce its temperature by half, then we can get it to become a superfluid. And a superfluid is super cool. It is an analogy to superconductors. See, superconductors don't have any resistance at all. A superfluid has no viscosity. It also has no, or rather infinite, thermal conductivity. That means that every part of the liquid helium has to be the same temperature all at the same time. This is rather a quantum effect. So immediately upon reaching the temperature where it goes superfluid, the boiling stops because it's all at the same temperature. Boiling requires a localized place where something is boiling out of. So it immediately gets perfectly smooth and and this quantum fluid then sees that it could reduce its energy by crawling out of the container. A quantum fluid knows where you've got it trapped and the liquid helium crawls up the edges like this and comes down here and spreads out on your table. And eventually, the entire substance of liquid helium will go out that direction because it knows it can ultimately reduce its energy. That is tunneling. It's in a higher energy spot and all it has to do is climb over the lid. Well, it does. It does that. I've seen it. You know, try it yourself. It's really fun stuff. Also, let's see another fun thing in quantum physics. You know, of course. If you have one of those sumo suits on and you run at a wall, let's see, put your sumo suit on. Let's say it's one of those orange ones. It's a big old sumo suit and you're running that direction and the wall looks like this, then you will bounce off the wall, right? Boing, that's cool. But what if the wall looks like this? Like you're running this direction and the wall, here, put your sumo suit on again and run this direction. If you run this way, 
Well, first of all, that's easy. Of course you'll bounce off that wall. If you run this way, in quantum physics, if you're very small or very fast, then you will bounce against this wall. What? 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 You're gonna bounce against this wall right here? Yeah, well, there's a boundary, and um, there's a certain chance that you will become reflected even though your energy is decreasing right here. You'll be bouncing off of the fact that there's a cliff there. So the faster you go, the more likely you are to survive running at the cliff as fast as you possibly can. Now don't try it because you're not very quantum. I'm not calling you fat, but sort of I am. I don't know, I mean, look, you're not quantum, deal with it. Also, some people got really, really pissed at some of these things. These things are ridiculous, right? These things are crazy, aren't they? Agree with me, these are insane. Schrodinger, in particular, was very pissed, so he locked up his cat. This is not true, he didn't actually do this. Schrodinger was a very nice man. He locked up a cat in his head, and he said, here's a cat, and I'm gonna put it in a box, and there's a diabolical device in this box that depends on the random chance that a nuclei will decay. You know, in, in uh, oh man, I guess in nuclear physics is all about quantum, so there's a statistical chance that something's going to happen. So in here, if there's a decay, there's a little guy Geiger counter with a dial on it, and if there's a decay here, then the Geiger counter spills a vial of poison, and in that case, the poison gas interacts with the ground, and the, uh, the cat dies. But there's also a chance, before you open this box, you don't know whether the vial has been knocked over because the Geiger counter sensed something, or whether it hasn't, and the cat's perfectly fine, you know, licking the Geiger counter and stuff. So, Schrodinger said, these things are crazy. If I put a cat in a box, it's not like the cat's alive in the box and it's dead in the box at the same time. That's insane, right? And everybody said, yeah, that does sound pretty crazy, but ultimately, it's true. The cat is both alive and dead, and if we make a graph of how much the cat is alive and how much is dead, like let's see, uh, percent live for the cat, you see there's a statistical chance that the cat is alive, and that chance goes down as a function of time, because there's some chance that it will be decaying, This that the decay will happen and the vial will be spilled. Also, ultimately, the cat's gonna need some water, so this will probably go to zero eventually, but the probability of the live cat decreases like this, and that's fair enough, it's sort of like a half-life kind of thing. We'll study this kind of decay, probably an exponential decay. But the cool thing is that the live cat is dying as the dead cat becomes more and more significant. And so we'll probably have a graph that looks like this, and the sum of these two adds up to a total cat, but we've got fractional cats overlapping inside the box. And until a conscious mind observes whether the cat is alive or dead, we don't know whether the cat is alive or dead. That's the simplest thing to say, but I'm gonna say the cat is actually both alive and dead. You know, it was designed as a counterexample, another one of these classic kind of Poisson mistakes. This is crazy. Let's go on. Another thing that happens in quantum that we've already seen, but I need to point out really just how insane this is, is that if you have a double slit experiment and you've got electrons coming this direction, then the electrons interfere with each other even if they go through the slit at the same time. So you're going to get an interference pattern where there's a bright fringe and, well, what I mean is a lot of electrons there and then you get this stuff here. Even if they go through one at a time, they are much more likely to land here than they are to land there and there's zero chance of any electrons ever landing here, which doesn't make any sense because you'd think an electron could just go right through and go poop right there. But it doesn't work because the electrons self-diffract. They interact with each other no, they interact with themselves. An electron goes through both slits simultaneously, and you're like, what? You can't through go through both slits at the same time, so you, <clears throat> so you get really mad, and you're like, no, 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 no. We're gonna check. I'm gonna put a little detector here, and my detector, I don't know what it, it's gonna be technically, but it's going to be a detector. A de wow, can't spell. Let's write detector here. Detector, wow, okay. 
So my detec detector, detector, ha, 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 my detector will say whether or not the electron has gone through this slit. And now if I know an electron hit the screen, then it either went through the slit and the detector will say yeah, or it went through the other slit and the detector will say no, it didn't go through my slit. If you put a detector here and fire electrons through one at a time, I'm not blocking either one of these. I'm just saying, hey, it went through this one, or no, it went through the other one. If you put a detector there, then suddenly this interference pattern completely disintegrates. This no longer happens, and the screen now looks like this. There are a bunch of electrons that go through right there, and there are a bunch of electrons that go through right there. This is no longer quantum. This is what you would have expected in classical physics. So if we know where the electron went through, it just went through there or there. If we don't know which one it went through, it went through both. How can it go through both? I don't know. We can't check because when we check, it goes through one of them. Either the one we're checking or the other one. But when we don't check, it goes through both as evidenced by the fact of a diffraction pattern. So knowing too much screws up the quantum here. Dang it. So here's the language that we need for this. If we're using a detector here, what we're doing is we're making a measurement which causes a collapse of the wave function. An electron is no longer just a little dot. It is a wave, and so it's like a wave packet. It's like this, and here's my electron, and there's a probability distribution where the electron may be. It could be anywhere in here. Some people talk about electron clouds. That's usually when an electron likes to hang around some protons or something. So the electron, as it moves through space, is a little wave moving through space. And if you say, hey, where are you, electron? You might find it anywhere where there's some significant wave here. The wave function, though, as soon as you observe the electron, collapses to a single point. And that's the collapse into this location or that location from this very interesting broader wave. If you don't look at electrons, they can be lots of different places at the same time. So quantum is very deep, very powerful. I encourage you to study it. Do not take anything that I've said here for granted. These things are nasty. I don't think you should accept, frankly, don't accept anything here. Go take a whole bunch of quantum classes at the nearest university. Goodbye.